Hello, listeners. This is Kat, and welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This will be the continuation of When Realities Collide. This will be Part 6, Chapter 6. Shota doesn't really know what to expect as he leads the kid towards the infirmary. He dismissed the class a couple of minutes early just so he could ensure they made it to the infirmary before the hallway suddenly got crowded. Shota doesn't think crowding the kid while he's nursing an injury like the burn he currently has won't do the kid any favors. He also doesn't have to worry about them running into Yagi, since today he's doing foundational hero studies with the third-year students, and by extension, that usually means additional training for a couple of them. Yagi, like Shota, isn't usually one to let students go before the period actually ends. It's actually one of the few days of the week Shota doesn't see the retired pro at all, not even in the teacher's office, since Yagi spends his mornings at the precinct doing behind-the-scenes hero work. Shota walks briskly towards Recovery Girl's office, Midori keeping pace at his side. It really is a worrying injury, one Shota would like to see get looked at as soon as possible. Burns are very susceptible to infection, and schools are always a perfect breeding ground for germs and bacteria, no matter how clean the place is. Not to mention how crowded schools are between the staff and the students. Bacteria is everywhere, so it's best to get Midoriya to a sterilized location where he can be healed, and the remainder of the injury can be wrapped up and protected from outside forces. It had taken everything in him not to react accordingly when seeing the injury Midori had been nursing. It was a burn, definitely sat somewhere between second and third degree. It looked bad, probably one of the worst Shota had seen come from a school exercise like the one they'd been doing. Shota had seen a lot of burns over the years. Fire-based quirks weren't exactly rare, but it's been a long time since one this bad had happened during classes. His class especially. He'd known there was a possibility something could have gone wrong. Midori talked about Todoroki and his reality using the fireside after a fight with Midori during the sports festival, and Shota can't lie and say he hadn't thought it was a possibility that Midori could get through to this Todoroki as well. He'd hoped, honestly, getting Todoroki to a point where he could comfortably use both his ice and fire would be amazing, but he hadn't really expected it to actually happen, not with how Todoroki tends to close himself off when the fire aspect of his quirk is even so much as mentioned. Todoroki's quirk... His fireside was a new addition to class, an unknown variable that Shota hadn't really prepared himself to deal with, since it was unlikely to appear, just as Midori himself was an unknown that Shota didn't completely understand. He'd put some trust into both Midoriya as well as the Aizawa Shota over in his reality, and he wasn't disappointed, though he probably should have set more specific guidelines when it came to the exercise, like calling a breather, at minimum. When injured, in any sort, it should be a given— but knowing his gremlins, and knowing Midoriya is one of these gremlins somewhere else, he is not surprised Midoriya is looking out for others' growth in the class instead of his own well-being. Other Aizawa really might have his hands full with Midoriya in his class, too. When a serious injury like Midoriya's does happen, no matter how much he wants to freak out and sweep the student off to the nurse, he's learned to read the student himself to determine how he should react. What he does as a figure of authority. A teacher and pro-hero will directly affect his entire class not just the injured student. Though what he says and does will have the most effect on the injured student, Midoriya in this instance. He has noticed that teens, like small children, often look for guidance when they're injured. When they're in distress and looking for comfort, they often look to the closest authority figure. It's a habit they haven't quite broken yet, not unlike children and toddlers when they get hurt. If Shota outwardly shows concern when the injured person in question doesn't, there's a possibility it will send the person into hysterics, He's seen concern from authority figures make them frantic. Like they'd wrongly assess the situation or are realizing that there's something wrong. Things get worse when the person they're supposed to be trying to keep calm and help starts to panic as well. No one's thinking clearly then. Plus, if he himself got worked up and panicked over an injury in class, no matter the severity, he'd lose his level head and quick thought process, which is a valuable asset in an emergency. He and everyone around him need someone to not be panicking. Everyone needs someone to take control of the situation and make sure what needs to be done is getting done, like getting Midoriya to Recovery Girl ASAP. Getting the kid help without causing panic in either the teen himself or Shota's 1A students. It's no different than first responders, doctors, and nurses needing to keep calm no matter what they're looking at in an emergency setting. People can die if split-second decisions aren't being made, and when you're panicking, your thoughts aren't as fast as someone with a clear head. And his young heroes in training, he needs to let them assess themselves first, before he steps in and guides the situation. Teenagers are more than capable of gauging their own pain, and most of his students are good about cutting themselves off if they need to. But, 
if they don't put up those limits for themselves, Shota will for them. He'll never hesitate in making sure any of his kids are getting the medical attention they need. Like Midoriya trying to refuse visiting Recovery Girl despite the burn. He hasn't quite figured that one out yet. Hesitance isn't usually something he sees when it comes to Recovery Girl visits. She's sharp, sure, but she does generally have a grandmotherly nature that puts the students at ease. Shota's once again reminded of the boy's worryingly high pain tolerance as he thinks back to spotting the injury right after the battle. Did Midori even know how urgent his burn truly is? How much pain does he feel? How much is he just enduring? Is this really something he's just used to? Midoriya didn't outwardly express any panic, not when it happened mid-fight and not when the battle had ended. He hadn't approached Shota. Shota had ended up approaching him. Midoriya hadn't looked like he thought the burn was serious, not as serious as Shota believes it to be. He talked about patching himself up, like it was a familiar thing to him, and the innocently honest words made something unpleasant coil in Shota's stomach. The child didn't cry or scream or even try to call the exercise off when he'd gotten hurt. He'd hardly flinched. Shota believes the burn must have come from that first burst of fire. It was big, pent-up flames like it had literally bursted from Todoroki in an act of desperation. Midoriya had been going in to land a hit when Todoroki had ignited his flames. He'd watched Midoriya spring backwards away from the flames, and seeing that, he'd assumed Midoriya hadn't been as close to Todoroki as Shota had thought. He was wrong, apparently. The kid had gotten heavily injured in a spot with endless nerves which would have hurt like hell, not to mention a spot that directly interferes with his fight style, as far as Shota could tell after observing the child in action. And instead of backing off and calling for a timeout or ending the match, he just continued to fight almost entirely one-handed. Not only that, but he'd also managed to keep his hand out of view as he avoided ice and flame attacks. Had Shota seen that hand before the fight finished, he would have called the whole thing off. It was the sort of injury he expected the students to know that it should be looked at immediately. And if Midori is in his class in another reality, which he really doesn't doubt whatsoever at this point, then the teen would know that. It may not be an incapacitating injury, but it hurts, and it can do serious damage if not tended to. Quick and correctly, burn ointments and healing quirks, sterile gauze and bandaging, as low a chance of infection as they can manage. But Midori had been smart about it, and that's something that showed us scared of. The kid hadn't cried out, or screamed, or even shed a tear. He hadn't even really brought attention to it himself. Shota has a sinking feeling in his chest that if he hadn't have brought it up, Midoriya wouldn't have. They come to a stop outside the infirmary. It doesn't sound like there's anyone inside. If they're lucky, the room will be clear of students and recovery girl will be tucked in her little adjoining office working on paperwork. Shota doesn't want any more stress piled on Midoriya's shoulders. Shota goes to open the door, hand settling on the door handle, but that's as far as he gets when he notices Midoriya had stopped a couple steps back shuffling nervously as he stares down at his own shoes. He's still got his hand cradled to his chest, and Shota can't even see the injury with how the boy's curled in on himself faintly. Shota eases his hand off the handle, turning to the kid with a cocked eyebrow. What's the matter? Midori shifts without looking up. The kid's got his hand curled up to his chest, opposite hand hovering over the worst of the burns. Shota hadn't gotten a great look at the boy's hand. He knew it was bad from the glimpses he'd gotten. You could tell that much from a distance but he doesn't really know the severity of it, considering Midoriya had hardly reacted. Just... Midoriya swallows, glancing to the side. Do we have to bother Recovery Girl? Bother? Shota repeats in hidden surprise. This isn't a bother, problem child. This is her job. She's paid to tend to your wounds. That's what a school nurse does. You have a serious burn, and it needs medical attention. I just don't like to bother her when it's... When it's something I could take care of myself, you know? She, um... She doesn't really like patching me up. I'm, uh... The kid swallows again, sharp and almost nervous. I'm a regular, I guess. Shota doesn't say anything for a long second. It feels like he stumbled into another red flag. Where is this hesitance coming from? Why is he nervous about being a regular visitor to the nurse's office? This is a hero school. The majority of the students are regulars. What makes Midoriya different? What did Recovery Girl or Midoriya's Recovery Girl do? He feels like he keeps walking himself into brick walls when it comes to unraveling the student before him. Whenever it feels like they're on the right path, Shota finds himself slamming headfirst into something new, something else he should be concerned about. This just raises more questions for Shota. 
Would the kid have hidden the injury had he not seen it in fear of a visit to the nurse? Would he have patched it up himself? This really wasn't the type of injury he could get away with that. There's a great risk of infection in a burn like the one he's nursing. Infection would spread fast in an open wound like that. Even with Recovery Girl's quirk, it'll most likely scar, and it won't be an instant heal. He'd still get bandaged up to protect the susceptible to infection wound, and he'll probably get prescribed some sort of pain reliever, too. Burns hurt. Hands have a lot of nerves and nerve endings that were essentially charred. He doesn't know how far the burn goes, but he knows it hurts. This isn't the type of injury you should be patching up yourself, Shota says slowly, taking his hand entirely off the door handle as he leans back against the wall. He's suspicious of why Midori wills him relief when he's no longer touching the door. The burn you have is likely a second degree that leans towards third degree. That's bad, kid. I doubt even Recovery Girl would be able to heal that in one go. It should be handled by a professional to minimize the chance of an infection. Midori hesitates, looking at the door before his eyes flick to Shoda. You're sure she won't mind? I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not even a student here, and with Deku being, um, a, a villain, I doubt she'd be comfortable with me. She won't mind, Shoda assures carefully. And if she does, we'll be having words. I'm sure Nezu would also like to hear about the school nurse displaying discriminatory tendencies. I have no doubt Nezu spoke to her personally about your presence here, and if she's still hesitant, that's a problem. I don't want to get her in trouble. If she's mistreating you, she'd be getting herself into trouble. Shota refutes calmly. He pauses for a moment, eyeing the child. Midori looks away when they make a brief half-second of eye contact. You can't keep taking the blame for others' actions, Midoriya. Shota reminds. He's not exactly sure what the holdup is, but it can't hurt to remind the kid anyways. What Deku has done, you had no part in. And if Recovery Girl mistreats a temporary student who just so happens to be named Midoriya Izuku and looks like the villain Deku, that's on her. You're not doing anything wrong by coming here with a serious injury. That's what this infirmary is for. This is a school teaching a dangerous profession. We expect injuries. But... The boy hesitates, staring nervously at the floor. He curls his injury closer to his chest, holding his injured hand by his wrist with his other hand. Shota spots the raw skin now that it's not covered. You're sure she won't mind? I'm sure. Shota nods, keeping his tone calming. And on the off chance she does mind, which she won't. I'll take you to the hospital myself. You're hurt, Midoriya. You deserve professional treatment. The kid swallows. Studying Shota like he's searching for dishonesty, Shota keeps his expression neutral, curious as to what the teen finds. Something has the boy shuffling closer, some of the tension easing from his expression. The man quirks an eyebrow as Midoriya finally slumps, his tense shoulders. Yeah, the boy finally blows out, but he doesn't look entirely convinced. Still, he looks towards Shota, with a grin that wavers faintly. Besides, it wasn't my quirk this time anyway, so... You're right, I didn't really do it to myself, right? I mean, it wasn't, um, because of me. So, uh, I'm sorry, L let's, uh, I mean, we can go in now, I'm ready. Shota thinks he should be pushing more about this. It's obviously another wall that Midori assembled at some point due to something regarding Recovery Girl or the infirmary, in general, that Shota doesn't understand. Whatever trauma relating to the infirmary could end up being dangerous and harmful if the fear and hesitance Midori harbors hinders his decision-making. If he doesn't get a serious injury treated, like the burn he was fully prepared to not even show Shota despite the obvious pain and severity, because he's afraid and it gets worse because of the lack of treatment. He hesitates just for a second before deciding that this conversation can wait. The kid's given his consent to go into the room now, and that burn really needs to be tended to. He can push while Midori is resting after a recovery girl's quirk treatment. Shota pushes down the concern, and instead gestures the kid to join him at his side, hoping to offer any comfort in the fact Midori isn't facing this alone. As he replaces his hand on the handle and finally opens the door, Midori presses into Shota's side, and the man says not a thing about it. He doesn't even glance down. The infirmary is empty, thankfully, and he doesn't spot Recovery Girl just milling around, so it's probably been a quiet day for her. There's a second where he and Midori stand side by side in the doorway until Recovery Girl finally emerges from her little adjoining office. Gaze narrowing on Shota first, almost disapprovingly before dropping to Midoriya, who almost cowers away from the small woman. She seems to notice just as well as Shota does, considering she makes no move to come any closer. 
It's you two, the nurse comments lightly. Nezu-san mentioned there was a chance I'd be meeting Midoriya-kun, so what are we dealing with, Aizawa-kun? A burn. Shota offers when Midoriya doesn't. He cups a calming hand around Midoriya's shoulder, leading the child into the room as Recovery Girl steps back to let them pass, leaning on her cane. Todoroki unleashed a surprise flame attack during our battle exercises, and unfortunately, Midoriya was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I see. Recovery Girl hums. Well, maybe I won't be dealing with so many frostbite injuries in 1A, though I'm not sure. Burns are much better. No matter now. Let's not dally. Come here, dearie. Come on, sit down on the cot and we'll take a look. Midori moves on autopilot while still managing to keep his distance from Recovery Girl. He scampers across the room, managing to shuffle up onto the cot one-handed. Shota follows suit, standing beside the bed. Midori shuffles closer to Shota as Recovery Girl finally joins them, now donning latex gloves. Shuzenji settles in front of Midoriya, waiting expectantly for the teen to offer up his injury to be assessed. Midori glances back at Shota, and it almost feels like the kid is just verifying that he's still here. Shota gives a nod of encouragement as he tries to pick apart the boy's actions while still keeping his focus on the child. Midoriya unfurls his hand, wincing as he spreads his fingers and shows the nurse the top of his hand. It's mostly the boy's knuckles that got hit. The burn runs down the backs of his fingers faintly, stopping just before the second joint. While it blisters towards the middle of his hand, in the other direction, it doesn't look as bad as Shota had been expecting, but it's still a fairly bad wound. Hmm. Shuzenji hums as she gently holds the tips of Midori's fingers in her hand, the thumb of her opposite hand grazing along the reddened skin around the worst of the wound. Quite the burn here, dearie. It must hurt. Todoroki-kun did quite a number on you. Midori offers a slow nod of agreement. I can use my cork on you. Though, by the looks of both your stamina levels and the depth of this wound, it won't heal entirely. I can't work miracles, but I can speed up the healing process. You'll still need to be careful and to keep the wound cleaned and protected so it doesn't get infected. Shizenji nods along with her own words, finally releasing Midoriya's hand. The teen curls his hand back into his chest, inching closer to Shota. The man hasn't moved, stood at Midoriya's side with his hands tucked into his pockets. The edge of the bed is pressing against the back of his knees, and he has half a mind to sit down beside the kid. He doubts Midori would mind. Shuzenji pulls the gloves off her hands, turning to the locked cabinet where she keeps medications. Shota watches out of the corner of his eye as she unlocks it and scrounges around through the pill bottles. Shota's glad to see ibuprofen in her hand, knowing Midori is likely in pain even if he's not showing it. Before we go any further, the old woman turns back to Midoriya, offering the two pills she dumped into a tiny plastic cup. You take these. Even after my quirk, you'll still be in pain. Aizawa-kun, why don't you go grab Midoriya-kun a cup of water to wash the pills down with? I'll gather up the supplies I'll need to tend to the burn, after it's been healed a bit. Shota doesn't feel great about leaving the kid, even if the infirmary has its own sink hidden away at the back of the room, as well as a small restroom. Midoriya's hesitance is still bothering him, so he doesn't want to go too far from him. Not when Midoriya is in a place where he doesn't feel comfortable, and Shota is acting as a stand-in figure of comfort. Shota doesn't know what the deal is, but if Midori is clinging to him, he's not about to take that comfort and security away. It would be illogical. Still, he'd known the woman too long to not do as she asks. Like Nezu, Recovery Girl had been on staff when Shota had attended this very school 15 years prior. She almost has the same amount of pull, and she's as highly respected as the rodent they call principal. He lingers for a second before finally stepping away from the boy so he can do his asked. Shizenji has a stack of little paper cups for times like this, so Shota grabs one and beelines for the sink at the back of the infirmary. He's still aware of the conversation taking place between the student and the nurse, listening for any more tales of Midori's discomfort or red flags in the kid's words or actions. You'll feel very tired after I use my quirk, dearie, Shizenji says lightly, the usual spiel for when she uses her quirk on someone for the first time. She's still buzzing around the room as she gathers her supplies, speaking as she goes. You're aware of how my quirk works, then. Some of your scars. I know the scarring pattern left by my own quirk. So you must have been healed by me before. Y yes Midori squeaks out. I, I do. I mean, I know the effects of, of your quirk. You've healed me a lot. I, um, I've come here a lot, I mean. Back when I was, wasn't very good at using my quirk. N not so much now, since I mostly understand it. The woman shoots Midori a knowing sort of look that Shota doesn't understand. It has the kid's shoulders caving in, though, as he makes himself look small. The child doesn't say anything, and neither does the nurse. There's a weird sort of tension that had formed, and Shota doesn't understand it. 
The underground hero returns to the cot where Midoriya has finally arranged himself so he's laying back against the pillow, spread along the length of the bed but still managing to make himself look small. The man watches as the teenager pointedly looks away from the nurse, despite how Shizenji is studying him still. He settles at the boy's bedside, shooting the nurse a challenging look, which Shizenji wisely backs down from. She goes back to searching through her hoard of ointments. With a sudden tension eased, Shota finally hands the water over to the teen before sitting on the opposite side of the bed in a visitor's chair that he pulls over. Midoriya's shoulders lose some of the tension as he pops the pills in his mouth and sips at the water, eyes flicking over to Shota every couple of seconds. Midoriya holds onto the cup with a tight, nervous fist, even when it's empty. He clutches at it with his good hand until Shota manages to ease the crumpled cup from his grip. Midori looks surprised to see the state of it, so Shota assumes he wasn't aware he'd been squeezing it. He wonders, if he took a closer look, if he'd find faint nail indentation scars. Maybe the kid could do with a stress ball or something. Hizashi has dozens. The man holds onto the cup, too. Instead of getting up to throw it away, he knows he just doesn't want to leave the kid again just yet. Not when he's already so on edge. All right. Shuzenji turns towards them, wheeling over a tray of various medical supplies. We'll try to make this quick. You'll be very tired after I use my quirk, so don't try to move too much while I bandage you up, all right, dear? Midoriya nods, offering his hand to her with little hesitance. The nurse looks the wound over again before leaning down and pressing a loud kiss to the boy's wrist, just above where the burn starts. Midori wilts instantly, in exhaustion, but stays awake. Shota silently concludes the teen probably has spent a great deal of time with Recovery Girl in his reality. He has the scars to vouch for that, after all, but he's also fairly used to her quirk. There we are, Shuzenji coos lightly as Midoriya's eyes slip shut before opening again, keeping an eye on his hand and the nurse still studying the wound. The old woman watches the wound heal, the rawest looking parts of the wound healing up to something close to a first degree. The skin is raw and inflamed, but it's no longer a deep, angry wound. It's not perfect, considering the skin likely would have needed a graft if they didn't have Recovery Girl's quirk on hand. She can't rebuild skin, but she can clean it up. The burn itself looks like it's been healing for weeks at this point, but the dip in his hand, leading towards his knuckles, now is obviously going to scar pretty bad. Shota bites his lip at the thought. Clearly Midoriya can't catch a break in any universe. At least his actual knuckles look better and will probably heal up well over the next couple of weeks, even if they are still burned. Shota had seen him fight. His whole style revolves around punching. He's glad the kid hadn't been burned enough to need to reevaluate his entire fight style. How are you feeling, Midoriya-kun? Shizenji asks lightly, a small smile on her lips as the kid's eyes sliver open to look at her. The quirk must be catching up to the physical strain of fighting all afternoon. The boy focuses his eyes, cocking his head to look back at Shota, almost as if assuring himself the teacher is still at his side, before nodding towards Recovery Girl. Good, she hums. I suspect that this'll leave some pretty bad scarring, but that can't be helped. That's all right, Midoriya finally murmurs. Thank you for your help. Shota watches from afar, as Shuzenji gets to work bandaging up the burn. He knows how to treat first-degree burns, so he's prepared to change the kid's bandaging later. The old woman makes quick work of cleaning it with a soft cloth and a small bowl of warm, soapy water before applying ointment to the wound. She then places gauze strips on the remaining raw parts of the burn, his knuckles and the tops of his fingers mostly, before she's wrapping the entirety of the child's hand so there's no chance of anything getting into it. When Shuzenji pulls away, Midori pulls his hand back, looking drowsily at her finished work. Thank you. It feels a lot better. You're welcome, dear. She smiles more with her eyes than her mouth. Shuzenji turns to clean up the packaging for the supplies she'd used, crossing the room to throw everything away. She even takes the cup from Shota's hands, which he'd completely forgotten he'd been holding. With everything cleaned up and returned to its spot, the woman stands beside Midori's bedside, gaze tracking over his reclined form, eyes shut but still awake. Shota leans back in his chair, content to let the kid rest, and Shizenji glances between the two of them before deciding to do the same, turning on her heels and taking exactly one step away. Um, recovery girl. Yes, dearie. The woman pauses, glancing back. Shota sees the kid's eyes open. Attention on the nurse. I, I'm very sorry to have bothered you today. The teen bows his head like he's expecting a lecture. I didn't mean to get hurt. Shizenji shoots Shota a bewildered look at the boy's words, but Shota doesn't know how to explain. He doesn't even really understand. The kid shouldn't be apologizing for getting hurt. That's a part of learning. It's a part of life. Nonsense, child. The woman huffs. 
I expect you to come to me with injuries like this, Byrne. This was a very serious wound, Midoriya-kun. Something like this needs professional treatment, and I'll hear nothing otherwise. This is not a bother. Not when it's your well-being we're talking about, you hear. B but you said... The teen clamps his jaw shut, looking away from both the adults. He sucks in a breath, glancing up before looking back down at his lap like a scolded child, even though neither of them said a thing. N never mind. And that's suspicious, isn't it? Shizenji is shooting Shota a narrowed look, and the man can only match her gaze. There's definitely something she'd said, not this recovery girl specifically, but the one in Midoriya's world. She'd said something that scared the kid. He doesn't know what. Can't imagine recovery girl saying anything that would fracture a kid's trust in her. All right, the woman finally concludes. I'll just be in my office for a while working on some paperwork. I want Midoriya-kun here for at least half an hour so I can monitor him. And he'll be taking some nutrient gummies before he's clear to leave. I suspect you'll be keeping him company. Shoda nods, even though the question is just a formality. Of course he's staying with the kid, and she knows it. If he's been here this long instead of just dropping the kid off like usual, he won't leave now. Good, Shuzenji huffs. Calm for me if anything happens, Aizawa. You know the drill. You boys behave out here. Shoda offers a silent nod that's really nothing more than bowing his head in her direction. Her lips quirk upwards as she returns the nod, turning on her heels and disappearing into her office. Shoda hears the office door shut with a soft click. The man glances back at the teen, seeing Midoriya's eyes shut. His eyes are shut, but Shoda can tell the boy isn't asleep. His breathing is too erratic, and his eyelids flutter like... He's making a conscious effort to keep them shut. The teen's injured hand is settled at his side, and his other hand is gripping the fabric of his shirt. He looks uncomfortable, even with just the two of them in the room. Shota leans back against the back rest of his chair, waiting a moment longer. Talk to me, problem child. Shota finally says, making sure to keep his voice soft, even though he's sure she's NG is distracted in her office. He doubts she'd eavesdrop. She has better things to do as the nurse of an entire school, and he knows her to be more professional than that. As a healthcare provider, she knows how important privacy is, and Shota hopes she trusts him to get to the root of this problem. The boy's eyes sliver open at the sound of his voice, eyebrows furrowing as he studies Shota suspiciously. How about what, Sensei? Why were you scared to meet Recovery Girl? I wasn't, Midori replies immediately. It's far too fast a response to be the truth, and Shota doesn't know if the teen knows he shuffles anxiously where he's sitting. Shota is quiet for a long second as the boy squirms. You were, Shota insists calmly. You were scared to come into the infirmary, and you're still scared, even now. I just want to know why, kid. I don't think it really matters, Sensei, Midoriya whispers, eyes squeezing shut. I think it does, Shota counters, leaning forward so his elbows are on his knees. Hands interlaced between his knees. It matters, if you're afraid to come for help when you need it. I don't like that, kid. You were scared before you even met this recovery girl, so it couldn't have been something she said, which leads me to believe it was something that's happened in the past, which still unnerves you. Midoriya's quiet, eyes slivering open so he's watching Shota. Shota makes sure not to give anything away in his expression or body language, taking care to keep his face neutral and his body relaxed even as his thoughts are going a mile a minute. This is a concern. Anything that could potentially harm Midoriya and either reality is a problem. Fearing going to the nurse, even when you need medical attention, is dangerous, and Shota wants to get to the bottom of it before it affects anything, before it hurts the kid in the long run. I want to help you, Shota sighs, leaning back in the chair. I want you to be safe, to feel safe here and ideally in your reality as well, but mine for sure. I can't help you if I don't know what the problem is. Midori hesitates, finally opening his eyes all the way. He looks tired, almost as tired as Shota feels. The boy snags his bottom lip between his teeth, gnawing thoughtfully. She won't get into trouble, will she? Recovery, girl, Shota guesses, keeping his toe neutral. The kid looks away, so Shota assumes he'd hit the nail on the head. No, she won't. Not here. She hasn't done anything wrong, just like you and Deku. You may be the same person, but you're obviously different as well. Whatever your recovery girl did to you will not fall back onto the recovery girl you just met. It's nothing bad, Midoriya finally breathes out, shoulder slumping. Not, not really. She was right anyways. I guess I've just sort of subconsciously held on to it, you know? Held on to what? Shota asked calmly. Back at the start of the year... 
The boy hesitates. Um, just after the sports festival, when I... After my fight with Todoroki-kun, um, just like this one, but... But we both went harder, I suppose. You already know I needed surgery after that. I was... The kid nervously rubs at the back of his neck, with his unbandaged hand. I was pretty banged up. Uh, All Might was there with me. I remember that. Shota listens quietly, picking the child's words apart. He's heard bits and pieces of Midoriya Sports Festival in his reality, and if the fight he'd just witnessed between Todoroki and Midoriya today was regular occurrence compared to the actual sports festival battle in Midoriya's reality, Shota knows it must have been a spectacle. We... The kid scrunches his nose up like he's trying to figure out a good way to continue. All Might and Recovery Girl were there when I woke up, and she... wasn't very happy... I've broken my arms enough times since I got my quirk that they're going to be irreparable at some point if I kept going how I was going. Okay. Showed a breeze in through his nose. He's got a lot of questions, like, why was All Might in the infirmary with a first-year student coming out of an anesthetic after surgery? He'll worry about that later, though. And what did she say to you when she was upset you'd gotten hurt? And that's where the boy clams up. He looks toward the office door, Shizenji had disappeared through, before slowly dragging his attention back to Shoda. His uninjured hand squeezes into a nervous fist, and Shota just knows there's crescent-shaped indents in his palm. He should text Hizashi about a stress ball, when he has a second. The underground hero is dragging his chair closer to the bed so he can settle his hand over Midoriya's, wedging his fingers between Midoriya's nails and his palm. The teen relaxes his fist on autopilot, now staring down at Shota's hand just barely holding onto his own. Finally, after a long second where Midoriya stares at where Shota's holding his uninjured hand, The teen draws in a shaky breath and gives a light squeeze of his hand. His next words are breathy and careful. She... She said she wasn't going to heal me anymore. Shota sees red. The school nurse had told a first-year student she wasn't going to heal him anymore. A first-year student who'd just gotten his quirk. A highly self-destructive quirk that he had zero control over. What kind of bullshit is that? The other Aizawa might not have known about just how recent Midoriya's quirk manifestation was, but the school nurse should have. Nezu as well, since the road knows everything. It's unlikely the two of them wouldn't have known, which just pisses Shota off even more. Well, the boy sputters, and Shota faintly wonders if he'd tensed up his own hand. That's not completely right. I mean, that's not exactly how it, um, how it really happened. She was upset, and, and she really didn't say she wasn't going to heal me anymore. Just, just... That she wasn't going to heal self-inflicted injuries caused by my quirk. She said, what? Shota tries very hard not to snarl, but he's not sure he succeeds. That doesn't make it any better. You said Recovery Girl wouldn't be in trouble, the boy yelps. I'm sorry, Sensei. It's fine, really. I I don't think she really meant it. I I don't think she'd withhold medical treatment. Not really. That doesn't change the fact that she threatened you in the first place. Shota reigns in the anger he feels swirling in his chest, swallowing down the growly tone. What she said, whether meaning it or not, made you honestly question whether or not you'd get help and medical attention if you got hurt. You were learning to control your quirk, a self-destructive quirk, that would result in self-inflicted injuries no matter what you did. She had no right to say that to you. You said she wouldn't get in trouble, Midoriya whispers weakly, hand trembling under Shota's own. The boy pulls away, and Shota follows suit, intent to keep the boy comfortable. She's not, Shota promises. It's illogical to punish one recovery girl for another screw-up. Just like we won't punish you for the shit Deku's done. That doesn't mean I'm not upset about this, Midoriya. That's not right. It's appalling, kid. Tell me that your Aizawa knows what she said to you. Tell me you told him that someone said something to her. She can't just say something like that, not to students who are learning. The boy's silence is all the answer Shota needs. He slumps back in the chair, like all the energy has suddenly been sapped out of his body, bringing his hand up to his face to rub a dry eyes. At least tell me All Might said something. He was in the room with you, right? More ringing silence. I don't blame her, the boy offers instead after a long second. She was right. I needed to find a way to keep fighting that wouldn't hurt my arms. They couldn't take any more damage, and she was right. There will be a point when even heal won't help me. She was giving me a hard truth, one I needed. But you are scared to go to the infirmary, even if you have an injury that needs proper treatment because of what she said to you. Shota reads between the lines, already knowing the words to be true. 
Midori still looks away from him guiltily, like he'd been caught. It's likely Midori would have done exactly that today if Shota hadn't have stepped in. How many times since she said that to you have you not gotten medical attention when you needed it? Shota asked softly. How many times have you patched yourself up because you were scared to see her? Does that not seem wrong to you, kid? Midori keeps staring the other direction at the wall, chewing hard on his lip. Whether she meant to or not, what she said negatively affected the way you regard her as a hero, and as the school nurse. It made you question her dependability when it comes to your injuries. Shota is staring up at the ceiling now, head thrown back. He doesn't look down even when he feels the student's gaze crawl back towards him. She scared you. Threatened you with something she had no right to withhold as this school's only nurse. He see Midori open his mouth, probably to defend the woman. Another theme showed us noticed, the kid genuinely defending people who've harmed him. He beats the kid to speaking, not finished yet. And I believe she didn't mean anything by it. And I don't doubt what she told you was truthful. There is a limit to her quirk. But saying she wouldn't heal you anymore, that's not okay. Recovery Girl has a duty of care. That's not something she can just say, no matter how upset she is. Shota looks down now, seeing the kid wilt as he stares down at his own lab. He'd pushed himself up at some point, now reclined back against the pillow and the wall, sitting with his legs crossed. His hands are tucked into the gap between his legs, bandaged hands settled delicately over the other. Is what she said really so bad? Midoriya finally asks, voice soft and thoughtful. I think it is. Joda tells him honestly. There are better ways to explain something like quirk dependability to a first year. I get that she was upset that you'd gotten hurt to the point of needing surgery after the festival, but she shouldn't have said anything of the sort. Especially, not while you were still recovering from surgery. It's different for me, though, Sensei. The boy mutters quietly as he glares down at his lab. How so? Shota narrows his eyes in challenge. If you mean because you got your quirk so late, that shouldn't affect anything here. You would have been just as injured as a child if you manifested it when you were younger. You can't control a quirk you just got. That's simply not how it works. Recovery Girl has been a nurse at this school for over 40 years. She knows that. If I'd gotten my quirk as a child, it would have blown my limbs off, Midori tells him dryly before tensing up. Uh, at least, um, that's what the doctor said would happen when, um, when it didn't manifest when I was little. But because it's, uh, really powerful and my body couldn't, you know, handle it. There's something about that delivery that tells Shota the kid's not being completely honest. Still, he can't pry now, not into the kid's quirk. That's been the one thing Shota hasn't pushed on. Just from what the kid had let slip, Shota can tell he doesn't like mentioning his quirk, and he doesn't want to do anything that could break the kid's trust. Plus, this isn't technically his student. Not in this reality, at least. He also has a... Gut feeling that this has something to do with All Might. He's been appearing a lot in this, in Midoriya's world. It seems, wherever the teenager is, the number one pro isn't far behind. It's actually fairly similar to Yagi and another student in this reality. Huh. A sharp inhale of breath draws in Shota's attention. He jerks his attention from his thoughts and onto the kid. The boy is rubbing the heel of his palm against his temple, eyes squeezed shut as if in pain. Wait, what just happened? What's wrong, problem child? Shota asks quietly. Leaning closer, he sets a grounding hand on the kid's knee, watching as Midori's expression pinches with pain. Shota can feel the tension on the kid's body just from the light pressure on his knee. His entire body is taut. You okay? What hurts? I don't... No, the kid whispers without opening his eyes. It's a really weird headache, but... Like, it's only in one spot. It really hurts, like sharp pain. It feels like... Something's wrong, but I don't know what. It's just, I don't know. Is it familiar at all? Shota questions cautiously. Did it happen when you got here? The headache? Maybe you're finally going back to your reality. No. Midoriya blows out through his teeth, squinting one eye open. It's never happened before, so I don't, I don't think so. Ouch. Okay. It's, um, it's easing a little. That was weird. And you don't know what caused it? Shota asked slowly, debating whether he should call for a recovery girl. He doesn't know how much help she would be, though. She doesn't know any more about reality hopping than the rest of them. You did have that migraine when you first got here. Was it similar to that? Not really, the teen shrugs, finally opening his eyes and letting his hand fall back into his lap. 
I've never felt anything like that, but I've also never come to another reality before. Maybe it's normal? Maybe. Shota offers, unsurely, no scrunching up. There's just so many unknowns here. Anything could be happening to Midoriya. They don't know what effects this could have on his mind or body. He's essentially in a place he doesn't belong. You okay now? Is it gone? The kid gives a slow nod, blinking in confusion. Yeah, it's... It just sort of stopped suddenly. Came on suddenly and stopped suddenly. Weird. Shota does not like this new development. A sharp pain in the kid's head that comes on suddenly and stops just as fast. That can't be good. You tell me if this happens again, all right? Yeah, the kid nods. I will, sensei. The door to the office opens, and Shota just knows that that's the end of the conversation. Midori doesn't trust Recovery Girl, and he can't blame the kid for that. Feeling rested, dearie? Shuzenji asks kindly as she steps towards them. I'm sure you'd like to get out of here. Just take a couple of these nutrient gummies, and I'll release you into Baizawa Kun's care. I've got an appointment coming in, and it's a little sensitive. Izuka sticks close to Aizawa sensei as he's led back to the dorms. A man's steps are quick, even as his shoulder slumps. Izuka somehow manages to keep pace, even as he feels the strain of today's battles and Recovery Girl's quirk effects settling in his bones. He didn't expect to be as tired as he is. He knows the burn was pretty bad, and it had taken a lot of his stamina to heal up the worst of it, but he hadn't been expecting to feel like he'd run a marathon. He's always tired after a visit with Recovery Girl, but it feels a little excessive this time around. Exhaustion that settles deep in his bones. He wants to just change into the cozy pajamas his teachers had lent him and flop face first into the comfy bed that's waiting for him in the guest room in Aizawa Sensei's apartment. His whole body aches, and his hand still feels like it's on fire despite how much better it feels compared to when he'd first arrived at the infirmary. Maybe he'll ask Sensei for more ibuprofen when they're upstairs. His head still feels fuzzy, the post-healing quirk kind of cloudy, but he hasn't felt that strange pulse of pain again. It really was the weirdest thing. He still doesn't know what that had been. It wasn't anything like the migraine that it felt like his brain was imploding, and it's like no other headache he's had in his life. He really doesn't think it has anything to do with being in another reality, but he doesn't know what else it could be. He's never had a headache come on so fast and disappear as if he hadn't even been there in the first place. A quick, pulsing sort of pain that's there and then it's just gone. He's a little worried about it, honestly. It could be nothing, though. That's always a possibility, especially when it comes to him. He shouldn't get himself worked up over nothing when there's so many explanations for the random stroke of pain. It's just weird having no one really to talk to about stuff like this. Not his Kachan who knows about one for all, or even All Might himself. He'll forever be grateful to Aizawa Sensei for all his help in this reality, and his own Aizawa Sensei who'd given him a chance, even against his better judgment on the first day. But he also knows the man is clever. He thinks Aizawa Sensei would be able to piece things together if Izuku threw him even just a little bit of line, which is why Izuku needs to be careful. He hadn't needed to rely on Aizawa Sensei like he is now. He'd never gotten so close, but he'd been desperate, and he knew, with his entire being, that Aizawa Sensei would help him. He's always been reliable, and he really is an amazing hero. Maybe he should let his teacher in more. Could Sensei help him? With one for all in techniques? If Izuku had both All Might and Aizawa Sensei in his corner, would he get better faster? Stronger faster? He really does need all the help he can get, as helpful as Gran Torino and All Might have been to him. All Might has insisted it was a secret, and that Izuku should keep it as such, but Gran Torino knew about the quirk without wielding it. He'd known Yagi-san's predecessor, and it helped All Might greatly with the quirk after his master had died. Other people can know. It's not like he wants to tell everyone, just Sensei. Izuku knows he'll be able to help. If he can help him here in a world where Izuku is an enemy, he can help in a world where Izuku is his student. Trust isn't something that comes easily to Izuku, not with how he'd grown up. Being kind and forgiving has nothing to do with trust. He trusts so very few people in his life, and Sensei is one of them. Sensei has been one of them for a long time. You can't watch someone lay their own life on the line for yours and not trust them. Besides, nothing bad has happened with Sensei knowing what he does about Izuku now, about Izuku being a late bloomer and about the suppressed fear he'd been harboring of the infirmary. He knows about Kachan and had even given the other boy consequences for his actions. He'd kept Izuku safe the entire time he'd been here, and offered comfort when Izuku needed it, and he'd been so amazing considering everything. 
Izuku was a villain here, and Aizawa-sensei was still putting trust into him, keeping him safe, teaching him and letting him be a part of his class, even though Izuku isn't a member of Class 1A here. Sensei had just accepted him so easily, and he hadn't even made it weird. He wonders if his own Aizawa-sensei would be as accepting, if another Midori Izuku wound up in their reality, then decides that, yeah, he totally would. You okay, problem child? Izuku startles, jerking his attention up to where Sensei has stood on the steps outside of Heights Alliance. Izuku had stopped moving at the bottom of the steps, lagging brain clearly not up to par with both thinking and walking up steps at the same time. He feels heat settle in his cheeks. I'm fine, Izuku clears his throat. Um, just, just thinking. The man studies him thoughtfully. How's your head? Good. I, uh, I mean fine. Izuku has never wanted more to facepalm for being awkward, more than he does now. Why did he have to be like this when Sensei is studying him? Why is that always the way? It's fine. No, um, no pain or anything. Or no weird pain. I in my head. Because, um, my hand still really hurts. But you did say, how's your head, so, um, good. His Sensei blinks twice before his expression softens. He gives a huff that sounds suspiciously like an exhale of laughter. I think you should probably lie down for a bit. Yeah, Izuku agrees sheepishly, cheeks flushed in embarrassment. I'm really tired. I can tell. The man gestures as you go up the steps. It's been a long day. The teen quickly catches up with a tired nod, relaxing as Aizawa Sensei's hand settles between his shoulder blades and guides him along like the man doesn't trust him to keep himself upright. Izuku doesn't blame him. They step through the doors together, and Izuku stumbles over... Slipping off his shoes, Sensei kicks off his own boots as well, waiting for Izuku to finish up, arranging his footwear against the wall with the rest of the students. The familiarity of it is like a breath of fresh air. It looks right, even if it isn't really right, not exactly. Midoriya! Izuku startles a second time, turning to where some of the students are sitting in the common area. It's Kaminari who calls out to him, grinning widely from where he's taking up one of the couches with Kachan, Kirishima, Ashido, Sero, and Jiro. The other couch holds Uraraka, Asui, and Hagakure. Hey, man. Kaminari pushes himself up, bouncing towards where Izuku had frozen at Aizawa Sensei's side. We've been waiting for you to get back. You were with RG for ages. It must have been an awful injury. I mean, it looked pretty bad, and Todoroki's fire was like completely unexpected. Caught everyone off guard. Yeah, Ashido agrees. And your whole hand's wrapped too. You okay, Midoriya? Y yeah. Izuku clears his throat, glancing sheepishly back at the straight-faced teacher. Um, yes, I am. Recovery Girl healed the worst of it. It's just... just wrapped to keep it clean, you know? I'm sorry again. Todoroki's voice startles Izuku a third time, and he really thinks the exhaustion is clouding his facial awareness. He hadn't even noticed anyone in the kitchen. Izuku turns to the direction of his friend's voice, noticing Todoroki and Shinzo in the kitchen. No, um, don't worry about it. Seriously, I... Well, I was hoping you'd serve fire today anyways. If anything, it was my fault for not reading your body language. I probably could have avoided your attack if I was paying more attention. It was an accident. Aizawa Sensei corrects easily, stuffing his hands into his pockets. It was no one's fault. Injuries happen in physical combat. Hence the need for a school nurse. R right Izuku agrees hurriedly. Really, Todoroki-kun, no hard feelings. I know it was an accident, and I wouldn't blame you for an accident either way. Besides, it was a really good fight. I'm surprised how well you used your fire after so long. Yeah, me too. Uraraka chimes. It was so cool, Todoroki-kun. It's amazing that you were the only one who was able to beat Midori-kun today. All the fights were so fun to watch. I trained exclusively with my fire as a child. The dual-haired teen informs dryly as he moves to stand beside the couch, not adding anything more. Izuka doesn't need to hear any more to know what he's really saying. I still need more practice. I think we all do, Shinzo mutters from the doorway. Midori kicked all our asses, one after the next. I think there's something we can all improve in. I need to work on my hand-to-hand. -hand. If he can break out of my quirk, who's to say others can't? If they do, I'm just a sitting duck, even with the capture weapon. Yeah, Kirishima nods, hardening up as if to add emphasis. Even with my quirk, Midori was able to get me out too. He's crazy strong. My ribs are still a little sore from that manly punch. It was good practice, though. Villains will be strong too, and I just can't stand around using hardening and expect to win. Yep. Ashido agrees sullenly. We all have things to work on. Midori really pointed out our weaknesses, huh? I'm with Shinzo. I totally need to work on combat. More room to improve, though. Izuka feels his cheeks heat up as most of the students look towards him. 
He shuffles awkwardly. I just know how you guys are where I'm from. I know how to counter your quirks and attacks from fighting them. Um, my 1A class. I was only able to spot the weaknesses because you're all slightly different in my class. I'm not really sure how, but I know you all can catch up. Is that a nice way to say he thinks we suck compared to his class? Hagakure teases. No! Izuku feels his soul leave his body as a couple of the students snicker. Really, it was just an observation. I'd never... It's probably you, nerd. Kachan scoffs, cutting Izuku's panicked attempt of digging himself out of the hole he'd found himself in off before they can really start, ignoring the invisible girl's input. What else is different between our realities? You. Plus, even after just one class, with you, you've pointed out that we're all useless against you. Your classmates are stronger than we are. We're the same people. Use your head, nerd. I, I never said anyone was useless, Kachan. Izuku's heart is absolutely racing. He'd never meant to offend them at all. Had they taken it that way? You're putting words into my mouth. There are differences, but, but that doesn't mean you're lesser to my class 1A in any way. We all need to keep practicing if we want to be great heroes. Hey, Hominari pounds. He's right, man. We're not so useless, Bakugo. Midori's just super strong. And we get you, Mito. We're just playing. No one took offense. Honestly, you helped us out here. Says the one who took himself out 30 seconds into his match. Katan draws with a huff. And I said, we're all, as in everyone, meaning me as well, not just you, Dunsface. I know there's shit I need to work on if he, Kachan gestures to Izuku with narrowed eyes, can beat me. Hey! Kaminari makes a wounded sound, drawing the word out dramatically. You're so mean, Bakugo. I miscalculated, all right? Math isn't my subject, besides. You guys are all lucky. I didn't even really get to fight him. Bakugo's right. It would have been so cool. You've got a seriously crazy quirk, man. But can it hold up against electricity? Not well, is a good myth sheepishly. You can all give me a run for my money in my class. I just know you're all capable of amazing things, so please keep working hard. You're so nice, Caro, Asawi mutters, still looking uncertain. Izuka pauses, glancing over as uncertainty fills in his own chest. Um, thank you? The frog-quirked girl frowns thoughtfully. I just... I saw you during the USJ attack. Deku, I mean. I saw your face, with Shigaraki and those other villains. He... wasn't nice. I saw what he and Shigaraki did to Sensei. I wasn't sure about you before. You just look like him, but you're nice. You're really a hero. I'm trying to be, Izuku assures with a tiny smile. Just like you guys, I really don't know why Deku is what he is here. I always wanted to be a hero, even when my quirk never came in. I can't imagine anything that would have stopped me, but something did stop him. I'm sorry I don't know more. Nah, Kirishima waves Izuku off with a grin. Don't worry about it. You've only been here a couple days, right? Not really your problem to solve anyways. You don't even have a Deku problem in your world, right? I think I am the Deku problem over there. Izuka snorts a laugh, ignoring the flurry of happy, as his classmates offer light laughs and smiles. I'm just chaotic good instead of chaotic evil. That sounds about right. Sensei huffs under his breath. Izuka isn't sure the rest of the class hears him, but it does have his lips twitching up in amusement. Hey, so if you're really a hero over where you're from, Izuka looks over to where Uraraka's cocking her head in interest. What's your hero name, Midoriya? Uh, oh, Izuku gives a nervous laugh, rubbing the back of his neck with his uninjured hand. You, um, you guys aren't gonna like it very much. It's actually Deku as well. It better fucking not be. Izuku blinks in Kachan's direction, surprised by the glare being shot in his direction. You'd better be playing right now, Izuku. If you made that your fucking hero name, Deku, I'm gonna actually punch you. Bakubro, Kirishima hisses, grabbing a fistful of Kachan's sweatshirt sleeve. Stop being so mean, since he's right behind him. You're already on house arrest. I don't care. He should stop being a fucking idiot if he wants me to stop being mean. The blonde roars. You made your hero name useless? What the fuck, Izuku? It's bad enough that you in this reality chose that for his villain name, some villain origin story or some other stupid bullshit. Don't tell me you honestly named yourself Deku as a hero. Hang on. Shinso chimes in from the doorway. What does Deku even mean? At this, Kachan bites the inside of his cheek, pointedly looking away from everyone, especially Izuku. The green-haired teen watches him in confusion until it hits him that Kachan is ashamed. He is guilty of coming up with a name. Izuku never thought Kachan might regret giving him the nickname. It never even crossed his mind, since Kachan hardly even talks to him. It was just a childhood nickname, Izuku offers quietly, half aware of the teacher watching them from just behind him. 
There's no doubt Sensei isn't taking this entire conversation in and picking it apart. Stop defending me, Kachan snarls, and Izuka stumbles back slightly in surprise. He bumps into Aizawa Sensei, but doesn't dare look away from his childhood friend. Kachan leans forward so he can address the whole room, drawing in everyone's attention. I gave him the shitty nickname because I was an asshole when we were little. You can read the last part of the kanji in the name. Izuku is Deku. Kachan says loudly, but not like he had when they were kids. There was no malice or mocking lil to his words. It's simply an explanation. One, Izuka doesn't understand why Katan's offering, because he wouldn't have told the students the origin of the name. His own class doesn't even know where Deku came from. Not really. The ashen-haired teen pauses before looking down at his lap. It doesn't technically have a meaning. It was just a nickname. Until I gave it a meaning. A helpless loser who's completely useless. It's not a nickname, it's a taunt. It's not a nice name, so I don't know why you'd make it a hero name. Bakugo, Uraraka frowns. That's horrible. I know, Kachan sneers, even as he slumps into the couch cushions. You don't have to fucking tell me. I was an asshole. I am an asshole. You've all got shitty nicknames, remember? He was just the first and happened to stick. Apparently too well if you're going by Deku as a hero, you idiot. I thought you only called us by those weird names because you didn't remember our actual names. Shinzo snorts from where he stood in the area between the kitchen and the living room area. Kachan swirls around in his seat to shoot the tired teen a dark scowl. I didn't know you remembered all that, Izuka frowns. We were very young. Well, I knew you'd remember the nickname, of course, but... Wow, that's almost exactly word for word, Kachan. Of course I remember, the teen huffs without looking over. Haven't stopped thinking about it since we found your shitty sneakers. Haven't stopped thinking about any of it. Listen, I can't say I never meant it because I did. I was a little bastard, and I know I meant to hurt you. But I am sorry. You didn't deserve it, any of it. The students looked confused at Kachan's words, but after their talk that first day, Izuku had met this Kachan. He knows exactly what he's talking about. Aizawa Sensei must know, too, because Izuku feels the man's hand settle on the top of his head. He's surprised by how much the hand just sat on the top of his head calms the rush of anxiety. The man doesn't say anything, but Izuku hears the silent question anyways. He's offering an excuse, authority in the situation, a way out without needing to explain anything to anyone else. Izuku appreciates it, but if Kachan is comfortable enough to be having this conversation with 1A around, he is too. I know, Izuku tells his childhood friend. You were an asshole, but I've forgiven you. Both of you, you and my Kachan. You should be held accountable for what you did to me, and for everything you've said over the years, and you are. But it shouldn't affect how your friends and classmates view you. You're different now. Okay, fine, nerd. Kachan narrows his eyes. But Deku... Seriously? That's really the name you're going to go pro with? I don't understand you. Why Deku? It's grown on me. Izuku smiles lightly. It's not a bad thing anymore. Not since I met you all. Uh, my class 1A at least. It's not a mean name anymore. It's... It's the name of a hero. Everything I want to and will be. A reminder, I guess. Of what I was and what I'll become if I keep working hard. I hate it. Katan glares hard, but Izuku just smiles. I did too. Izuku agrees with a laugh. But it also shows how much you've grown too, Kachan. The fact that you do hate it now. You gave it to me when I was quirkless and weak. But I'll make it into something strong, okay? I'm not going to call you Deku, Kachan snaps, and he laces his arms over his chest tightly. Never again. It's a fucked up name. You're a damn idiot for choosing something like that as a hero name. I don't care what you fucking tell yourself to make it feel alright. I won't do it. Okay, Izuku offers another smile. This one's softer. He honestly doesn't mind what Kachan calls him, as long as his tone isn't cruel. It's weird seeing Kachan so hellbent on not calling him Deku, when for ten years of his life, it's the only name the ashen-haired boy seemed to remember. His own Kachan still calls him Deku more than anything, but to be fair, it is his hero name now. Still, Deku isn't what it had been when they were children anymore. Not even to Kachan. Izuka glances over to where Kachan is stewing, glaring straight ahead of him. It's nice that Kachan is different here. He thinks this reality is Midoriya's fake suicide, hit his childhood friend more than he's really letting on. Taught him a gruesome lesson, one Kachan likely won't forget. Izuka's been watching the interaction this Kachan has, how he treats and talks to his peers nice, calmer yet still in such a Kachan sort of way, even how he's putting himself on the same level as them, in a way that his own Kachan probably never would. Kachan really has grown up a lot here. 
Maybe there's still hope for his own Bakugo Katsuki back in his reality to come to a point like this. Not that Katan is ever overly cruel anymore. Izuka still considers him a friend. Well, sorta. Katan does know the most about him, of anyone else, one for all and all might stuff included, and Izuka likes to believe the feeling is mutual between them. All right, all right. Izuka hears Sensei's voice as the man's hand ruffles faintly in his hair, wiggling Izuka's head lightly as he does. That's enough excitement for one night. Midori needs to rest, and you all should be thinking about what you're doing for dinner. It's getting late. That's what we were doing. Shinzo crosses his arms over his chest. It's Todoroki and I's turn to cook. You two just distracted us. How are we supposed to focus when Midoriya has caught on all soft and apologetic? Everyone stops to ogle a miracle, Sensei. I'll blow your fucking ass up if you call me caught on one more time, I bags. Enough. Both of you knock it off. Now, do I need to get the fire extinguisher? Aizawa's sensei retorts plainly. The two of you better not be leaving the stovetop on without watching it. I don't care what's going on around you. We've all seen the dangers of fire. Izuka can't help but feel like that's directed at him. Rude. It's cold soba, Todoroki offers as he moves to join Shinzo in the kitchen again, leaning over to look at the giant pot simmering on the stovetop. We're only boiling water to cook the noodles. I doubt it'll burn or catch on fire. Will you and Midori be joining us, Sensei? No. Aizawa Sensei shakes his head, tucking one hand into his pocket, while the other, that had been on Izuka's head, drops to the teen's shoulder. We'll be all right, thanks. You students take care of yourselves and enjoy your dinner. I'll be upstairs if you need me, but no visits tonight unless you need me. Midori should rest after his time with Recovery Girl. You'll see him tomorrow, got it? The students in the room repeat a low, almost monotone, got it, back to Aizawa Sensei. Izuka hears the amused inhale from the man beside him. Good. Sensei says with a bored tone as he leads Izuku towards the elevator. Let's go, problem child. Remember, I'll be back down for curfew patrol as usual. Please be in your rooms by ten. Izuku hears more murmurs in response to Aizawa Sensei even as he's guided into the waiting elevator. The door is shut behind them and Izuku slumps his shoulder, in a mix of relief and exhaustion now that he doesn't need to be peppy and cheerful for 1A. He's trying hard to be the exact opposite of what they know Deku to be. He doesn't mind letting the act fall with Sensei. He's comfortable with the man. Besides, Sensei had seen him crumpled over at his dining table with a migraine, and also, when he's been chained to a police interrogation table, bawling his eyes out, he's seen Izuku in worse positions than exhausted. They can be a lot, Sensei mutters quietly, yet hinting towards fondness. I'm sure your class is no different, though. I'm sorry that you're the subject of their interest instead of being a part of it. It must be hard for you. They're starting to differentiate you and Deku, that's good. I'm sure even when you return to your reality, these students won't forget you and what you've done for them. I'm just trying to be their friend. Izuka looks towards the man with tired eyes. I want them to be the best they can, no matter where they are, and... And I want to be their friend here, too. I'm not sure if that's selfish, though. I'm not part of this. These aren't my friends, not really. It's human, Sensei tells him patiently. You're in a tough position, and even if they're not exactly who you know, they are the exact same people. There's nothing selfish about wanting the people you view as your close friends to look at you in the same regard. There's nothing wrong with seeking comfort and familiarity. Izuka doesn't know how Sensei knows exactly what to say to make things feel okay. His own Sensei has the talent of being able to say exactly what they need to hear as well. It must be a universal Aizawa Sensei trait. The elevator dings, and Izuka finds himself being ushered towards the apartment door. Sensei pauses just to unlock the apartment door before continuing to usher Izuku in. Izashi's grabbing sushi for dinner tonight on his way home from the radio station, so I hope you're not allergic. Izuku shakes his head in response. Good. He'll be home any time now. Why don't you go get changed out of your gym clothes? If you want to shower, we can wrap your hand in a plastic bag so the bandages don't get wet. You'll still need to be careful, though. I'm too tired to shower. Izuku yawns, dragging his uninjured fingers through his curls. It's not really greasy, just a little dirty from those battles. And he thinks, if anything, he probably smells like sterile, which is a little uncomfortable, but not the worst. I've been looking forward to pajamas, though, and going to sleep. I'm drained. The man scrunches his nose up. Try not to fall asleep until you've eaten something, especially after spending the afternoon with Recovery Girl in the infirmary. You'll need nutrients. Would you like something now, so you can go to sleep? I can wait. Izuka decides with a light smile. I like sushi. Sensei offers his own light smile. If you're sure, problem child. Izuka gives a nod, shuffling towards where he knows the guest room to be. 
He pauses in the doorway, turning back to his teacher. Uh, um, sensei. Aizawa sensei pauses as well, where he'd been on his way to the kitchen. The man turns towards Izuku, cocking an eyebrow in silent question. I, um, I was wondering if there was anything I could take from my hand. It, what recovery girl gave me is starting to wear off and it sorta hurts. And by sorta, you really mean that it hurts bad enough for you to actually ask for something to help with the pain? The man snorts as he lets a tiny, crooked, almost knowing smile curl onto his lips. Of course, problem child. We've got more ibuprofen somewhere around here. Why don't you go get changed while I find it? Thank you, Sensei. Izuku breathes out, bowing his head gratefully. You're welcome. All right, listeners, this concludes Chapter 6 of When Realities Collide. Chapter 7 will be next. Personally, I'm a big fan of this chapter. I really like fix that touch base on Izuku's conversation with Recovery Girl and how that could have been really harmful for him. So the fact that the author handles that conversation so well just is something I love. I absolutely adore this chapter. I'm eager to hear your thoughts and reactions as well. And as always, thank you so much for listening.